Uh, welcome everybody. I'm here with Travis and Jeff and today we're going to be going over some notes from the deposition of Amy Lehman. Uh, Jeff, you've read this whole document, right? Yes, sir. Uh, this is your presentation you put together. Uh, yes, sir. So as, as you're calling it up, um, you know, this presentation uh, was one I originally put together uh, to do on uh, Linda's channel. Uh, and uh, you, I'm sure you can find that, uh, both Jay Jacks, uh, uh, Jack61, uh, and I uh, participated in it. We did sort of a three or four video series um, that included uh, um, Deb Strauss's deposition, uh, um, Amy's, uh, Amy Lehman's, uh, I think we did one on the Peg Lot and Schlager whitewash, and the final one on Jennifer Nashold, uh, who, and we can talk about, uh, you know, uh, who, who, who she is, and she's now Judge Nashold. Um, but, uh, you know, all this goes back to the depositions of the 1985 case. Uh, you know, they have special rules. This is, this is about the deposition that were, that were foiled from, uh, you know the the, um, the 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 company that that tapes the the trial and uh, you know there was a big GoFundMe. I think it was led by one of the people who led it was Eric is Banana Man. Uh, there's specific rules about not being able to share the depositions. You can only put excerpts up like that. So I think we follow the rules. Uh, I, so I'd, I'd uh, you know point to the the previous videos uh, and I think contact Eric is Banana Man if you if you want to get access to the the raw deposit raw depositions uh, yourself. So um, uh, this, this is the deposition of Amy Lehman. Who's Amy Lehman? Uh, uh, th there were two, uh, pe when Peg Lautenschlager, well actually uh, the, the, the original briefing, uh, the original investigation was requested by the Manitowoc County DA uh, at the time, uh, whose name is Millbilly. Uh, uh, Dennis Vogel. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, no, well, Dennis Vogel was, was the DA at the time of 1985, but the one the one that requested it was Mark Rohr. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, to, uh, re requested the investigation for certain reasons that that we'll we'll get into, and he requested that he, he requested uh, directly that the Attorney General, uh, you know, sanction an investigation from the the the, part, the local the State Department of Justice. And the way that it worked was that uh, the state DOJ sent two investigators out uh, to sort of gather facts uh, and write reports uh, about this. Uh, and those those um, th those individual reports, I think the FBI calls them 302s, um, but uh, I, I'm not sure what the local local the State Department of Justice in Wisconsin might call them. Actually, combined those sort of individual findings, uh, those those you know uh, submit, initial submitted reports, into a larger report that we now know is the, that we now refer to as the Peg Lautenschlager document. Uh, and th they were, uh, you know, the two agents that were sent out to do the investigation uh, was one, Deb Strauss, and two, Amy Lehman. We know Deb Strauss because uh, she actually calls up uh, the uh, Calumet County Sheriff's Office on um, right. November 4th, yep. <laughs> before the, a day before the RAV is even found and says, well, I hear Stephen Avery's name keeps on coming up. I don't know from where. I'm no fan of Stephen Avery and I'd like to participate in this investigation. Deb Strauss, one of the investigators, one of the two people who did the investigation, the unbiased investigation of the, uh, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the 1985 uh, case and how it was handled by law enforcement, calls up on the fourth to, to, to do that. Well, the other one was Amy Lehman, uh, and uh, they were both uh, gave their depositions on the same day. Uh, Deb gave hers in the um, in the morning, and Amy gave hers in the afternoon. Uh, and uh, th this is this is kind of what follows. Uh, th th this 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 is what this is about. Uh, the reason that we that we're kind of doing this is because uh, you know uh, tra Travis and I had a gentlemanly disagreement uh, as to whether the 1985 case was just a severe case of myopia, or whether whether there was sort of you know some real malfeasance there, some uh, some uh, um, 
some real shenanigans uh, that 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 got that got pointed out. So uh, this is just kind of a chance to review what happened in uh, in '85 and 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 some of the things that were said at the very end. Uh, we'll talk about some of the things that were asked by uh, the attorney for Dennis Vogel. Um, that make me think that you know Vogel is getting a little bit nervous, and you know maybe he was ready to flip uh, on this. And uh, did they did they really need a plan uh, for, for for doing that? So um, you know, with that said, it's not a long presentation. It's probably not going to be too long of a live today. Uh, but why don't we move on to the to the next? And you and you, and you have it up. Uh, and unfortunately, I have it up too because I'd never be able to read that on my on my phone. Uh, there were a lot of lawyers present at this uh, deposition. Stephen had two lawyers, uh, Walt Kelly and Stephen Glenn. Uh, the name of the eternal for uh, the name of the attorney for Dennis Vogel. That's actually a picture of Dennis Vogel in the top middle. His name was uh, Claude Cavelli. Uh, the attorney for the um, uh, Manitowoc County was a guy named Timothy Bascom. Uh, the attorney for Tom Kasurk was a guy named Raymond Pol Pollen. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, both uh, Amy and Deb were both represented by the same attorney, probably appointed by the Department of Justice, uh, whose name was Corey, Corey Finkelmeyer. Uh, and uh, also in case uh, people didn't know, the reason why Kasurik and Vogel have their own lawyers uh, is because they were all being individually sued by Stephen Avery. Uh, for their uh, as for, for for their quote unquote malfeasance uh, on on this uh, on, on on this case, so they since they were being individually sued along with Manitowoc, uh, they had their <clears throat> their own individual lawyers present. So uh, that that's that's it. You know, you tell you can't tell the players without a program. Uh, those there's your there's your program for who the lawyers are anyway. Uh, and there was a lot of. Uh, uh, a lot of objecting. So that's one of those reasons I was able to read it so fast because half of it is the lawyers objecting to one question or another and it being uh, rephrased. So let's move on to slide three, if that's okay. Uh, and you know, one thing that keeps on coming up, I suppose that this, this is a, an, early, an awfully early time in the presentation to take an aside. Um, but wouldn't you know it that Amy Lehman was, was in narcotics too. Every, that one, one thing that people you know, often point out about this case is there were a heck of a lot of narcs on this case. You know, people people who are narcotics. Like Remaker was a narcotics officer, right? Uh, Deb Strauss was in narcotics uh, at one point, and so was Amy. Uh, so, and, and you, you can you can kind of tell, uh, you know, to the, for, from her answer to this question. Uh, I'll just I'll just read it. How long have you been employed at the Department of Justice? And she says uh, since October 1992. And this this would be uh, you know either 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 Stephen Glenn or Walt Kelly asking these questions. I don't remember which one. Um, uh, and prior to your service in the Public Integrity Unit, what you And each, she said, I started in narcotic, narcotics, worked there for four or five years, and then transferred to white collar crime career. I think she overlapped that time in narcotics, uh, but I'm not 100% sure about that. It's a lot of a lot of narcs on the Avery Salvage Yard, and that's something that's that uh, sort of bugs a lot of people and is, is, a, is a point of interest. Uh, so, mo so moving on to the next uh, slide. Uh, you know, and I suppose this is very common, uh, Travis, in, in, in legal issues that, uh, you know, two people who are in the same room at the same time can't remember the same issues of the same conversation. Um, but it's interesting, uh, you know, about when, when you ask yourself, you know, what, what is sort of as, as, an, as an investigator, you have to ask yourself, what is paragraph one? Why did, why did, this, why did this thing kick off? Uh, and, and Amy's recollection is much different than, De than Deb's recollection, and I thought it's uh, I thought it was interesting to point out uh, the, the contrast between their recollection of why this investigation started. Um, so, according to Amy, uh, it's my recollection uh, that he brought the DA's case file. Uh, is my recollection, and I don't know specifically what made him come to us. And they're talking about Mark Rohr. Uh, other than the fact that Avery was being released and he wanted it reviewed. Uh, question, did he describe to you information that he was receiving from people in the courthouse after Stephen Avery had been exonerated and released about what people were saying uh, they knew back in 1985 and when this trial took place? Uh, and she says, I don't remember that. She doesn't, she doesn't remember uh, any, anything to do with people saying, especially you know, people at DA's office, example, for example, saying, a lot of us really thought it was Gregory Allen in the first place. She's saying, I don't remember any of that. I don't remember any of that from Mark Rohr. 
when the same question is asked to Deb Strauss, uh, kind of goes like this. All right, at that meeting, did Mark Rohr report that he had been receiving information in the courthouse since the time that Stephen Avery's conviction had been vacated and that there were people who had been in the DA's office or the sheriff's office at the time who thought that Stephen Avery had not committed the crime and that Gregory Allen had uh, and, and that they, uh, they, Mark Rohr and his assistant, were very concerned about that. Deb Strauss, absolutely, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, I, I believe the, I believe that was the driving force behind him coming and requesting the investigation is that he had started to hear these types of comments from people in his office. That's a, that's much different recollections of, of how this investigation started. Uh, Deb emphatically remembers that. And, uh, you know, Amy, ah, you know, uh, a, little, a little bit bubbly on that question, if you ask me. Uh, that, that would be something I think as, as an investigator, you know, I know, I know people in the, in the DOJ, the federal DOJ, and they said, you know, they say to me, if there's one thing you remember, you remember paragraph one, paragraph one is I was given this investigation because I got, um, you know, I, I got, I got a phone call about, uh, you know, a store that was robbed and uh, I had to start this investigation because of that, you know, investigators remember paragraph one. So, um, Makes you makes you wonder about Amy just just right right off the bat that she can't be even be honest about uh, or have such a poor memory about something she worked on for so long so hard why it actually started. Um, <clears throat> so let's move on to slide five. Um, and a you know a, a famous question that we ask ourselves in politics right now is what did they know and when did they know it. Uh, it's a very good. It's a very good question. I, you know, I think it was popularized under uh, the Nixon administration for for you old geezers out there like me and Travis. <laughs> um, so, so um, both uh, Deb Strauss and uh, Amy Lehman agree uh, that it was really important to I to, to the investigation to uh, understand whether or not the information. Uh, from the Manitowoc Police Department uh, uh, reg regarding uh, the, the per per persistent surveillance of Gregory Allen ever made it to Kasurik, um, you know, uh, to, to, to pot potentially thwart the, uh, you know, Kasurik's, uh, you know, mental uh, conviction that Stephen Avery was actually, that was, was, was the one, was, was the one that did it. So it was important for them to to to, f to find that to find that out, uh, and and that that's obvious, right? What what did Kasurik know? Uh, Kasurik, of course, claimed has has no recollection of being made aware that the Manitowoc uh, Police Department had this guy under surveillance, or that anybody from the Manitowoc Police Department came to his office and said that you know we had this guy Gregory Allen, it fits his mo in certain ways, and that he was probably the guy. We we think that he was probably the guy that did this. Right. So, uh, you know, they, they do their uh, their due diligence and try and trying to, uh, to, 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 ferret, to ferret this out. Um, so some of the questions that, that are asked. Um, OK. Uh, and um, uh, one of the tasks that you and Ms. Strauss and the lawyers who were uh, working with you had set was to determine whether or not the information known to the city of Manitowoc Police Department detectives was somehow communicated by one or more of them uh, to the sheriff of Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department. That's Tom Kasurik. Uh, and she answers, yes, we did look at that. Um, uh, and so, and so this, this quotes from uh, one of the insets. Um, uh, and and to, 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 fo to follow that question, what was uh, um, well, Mr. Bergner, and Mr. Mr. Bergner is a, uh, a, a somebody from I think he was the, uh, the deputy uh, deputy. Um, what, would, what would the, the title be? Uh, the second in charge of the of the Manitowoc Police Department at that time. So he's he's a, a law enforcement official. Mr. Bergner told us that he had gone to see the sheriff. Okay, and do you remember about uh, what Mr. Bergner told you about what he told the sheriff? Answer. He believed that Allen was a viable suspect. Okay, well that's that's pretty that's pretty clear. Um, how much time had elapsed? So there was a bunch of you know questions and and uh, you know uh, objections to that. So I kind of I kind of skip over that and, and get the sort of the meat of the next question is how much time had elapsed. 
And Amy says, well, I guess my understanding was that it was relatively soon. I mean, they arrested Steve immediately and there was concern that Alan was a viable suspect. So I believe it was, you know, in short order that he talked, uh, that he was talking to uh, Kassarik. Um, uh, but I don't know specifically how much time had passed. Um, so uh, let me actually let, uh, why don't we quickly skip to slide eight. Um, and again, um, uh, so, so this, 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 is, this is a good point to uh, talk about what, uh, what, Michael, what Michael Griesbach uh, he, he talks about in his book, Indefensible. Because not, not, not only, um, you know, are we going to uh, hear him talk in a minute, um, you know, uh, wh why, why was, let, let's, let's, let's just, let me read what, what, what Michael Griesbach, who was the assistant DA uh, in Manitowoc County under, under Mark Rohr, uh, what he wrote in his book about how, what, what, what he thought about Dennis Vogel's involvement was uh, in, in the 1985 case. Um, I hung up the phone and just sat there in my office for a while, reflecting upon our conversation, right? I got a phone call from, from Vogel. Uh, Vogel's question that he asked uh, uh, on, on the telephone, is there anything on Allen in the file implied to, to Griesbach that he knew, that he knew, that Vogel knew that Allen and not Avery was the assailant, didn't it? He was covering his tracks and he must have thought I'd go along. How else could I take it? Despite their reputations, most attorneys possess as much integrity as the next person, and maybe even more. I'm not sure whether you agree or disagree with that, Travis. Maybe you can weigh in on that later. Um, but Dennis Vogel appeared to be one of the exceptions, right? That he didn't have this, this level of integrity. How could he prosecute someone that he knew was innocent? And how could he let somebody as dangerous as Gregory Allen go free? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so what we have here is, is more confirmation from uh, Michael Griesbach. And if we could, Millbilly, maybe we could, maybe we could put up the, uh, the, the video. You can find this uh, video uh, online on YouTube. I'm sure we can probably add a link to the description, but this is Michael Griesbach uh, talking as a panelist on you know, overzealous uh, uh, prosecutors. And he's giving his background on the, on the Avery case and, and talks about a point where the Avery case went from you know, being, well, you know, poorly handled to a point of malfeasance. And if we could start that, that's the context that's what we can start from, from here. became the mugshot so in a sense they had their suspect there we go uh the police had a mugshot of stephen avery brought up from his arrest prior to uh, the case and the folks who did the wrongful conviction lawsuit after the exoneration 18 years later are convinced that the mugshot of stephen avery was basically looked at by the uh, police artist sketch, and then the artist sketch became the mugshot. So in a sense, they had their suspect working with the victim. They developed uh, this artist sketch that looked, in the words of the trial court judge, had an uncanny resemblance with the mugshot. 
So already it looks like police are, are getting toward a situation where they know who it is and they're manipulating the evidence, kind of the opposite of what police and prosecutors are supposed to do. So it goes to trial, the case goes to trial, and despite 16 alibi witnesses and a time slip, a receipt from a Shopko, a department store in Green Bay, uh, that showed it was virtually impossible for Mr. Avery to have committed the crime, the jury convicted Mr. Avery. And again, that sort of bias that even goes beyond the prosecutor, but to a community started to take effect because uh, Penny Burnson, the victim in this case, and her husband Tom were business people. She was an extremely articulate, wonderful woman. Uh, she, the prosecutor routinely went through the attack. It wasn't an issue of uh, how brutal the attack was. The charge was attempted homicide, sexual assault, false imprisonment. So the need to sort of prove the crime wasn't there so much. It was who did it. But the whole trial basically was Penny's identification and over and over again, kind of her recounting through witness statements to the police earlier and through her own statement to the jury, a reenactment with her husband um, of the crime. Very odd, in my opinion, how it came off. Uh, so that's the issue, in, in, my, in my opinion, about how we as prosecutors, sometimes we can use sympathy, we can use emotion. To some extent, that's valid. Uh, since uh, we are advocates, but we can go overboard. Uh, and in this case, we went overboard. So far, no, no, no real misconduct. I started my, co my comments with my misconduct uh, and with, with prosecutorial or police misconduct. I don't think it's there yet, but soon this case developed into something where it was different. The police, uh, uh, Penny Burnson went to the police shortly after he was arrested, Mr. Avery, and there were several phone calls made to her late at night, uh, by, which is often done by assailants when they know their victim. And she thought this was the assailant. Couldn't have happened, couldn't have been Mr. Avery though, because he was in, locked in, in jail, awaiting trial on bail. Uh, with no access to a phone at that point. Penny Burnson goes to the police and she says, look, I think it might be somebody else. And worse, the police agency, the city police agency, a larger police agency, goes with Penny, a detective, to the sheriff and says, look, I think you really got the wrong guy. We've been tracking this other person, Gregory Allen, who matches the description much better. I think he's the guy that did it. The case goes on, it goes to trial. Staff in the district attorney's office actually go up to the DA who is prosecuting the case. Look, he looks, we've seen this Gregory Allen guy in trial. He looks like the assailant. Not only that, Gregory Allen, the true assailant, had attacked brutally a separate woman on the same stretch of beach, roughly, with the same kind of MO, and including calling the victim after him. Uh, one year earlier, almost to the day, and the same prosecutor who went after Mr. Avery had prosecuted Mr. Allen, the true assailant. I found that case, the com criminal complaint in the police reports in the Avery file when the wrongful conviction came out years later. So that showed, I believe, that the uh, prosecutor at the time knew who the correct person was, somebody two years prior, and uh, prosecuted the person, uh, a person who was only a vague match of the description and in many ways did not at all fit uh, the description of the true assailant. Uh, the staff went to the DA at the time and the DNA said, no, it can't be this other person I prosecuted two years uh, earlier because, or one year earlier because he's on probation. I called the probation agent and the probation agent said there's no way he could have did it, done it. He has an airtight alibi. I checked. He was in some other city. Well, it turns out in the Attorney General's investigation after we took it there 18 years later, after Mr. Avery served all that time, that Mr. Allen, the true assailant, wasn't even on probation. So the DA had told the staff, it can't be that assailant. He's on probation. Well, the fact is he wasn't even on probation. Uh, my time is short, so it's hard to sort of explain what else is there to show that this is one of those wrongful convictions that sort of shocked the conscience. Um, 
but it is. Hold on. Oh, I gotta change this. All right, go ahead. Yeah. So re re let's you know re reviewing the information real quickly from from slide five. We know uh, from from what Griesbach just said that Penny went to the um, that was accompanied by a Manitowoc police officer to Caserix. We now know who that was. That was Mr. Bergner, who was mentioned here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, neither Amy or Deb could recall that the Manitowoc, that Mr. Bergner was actually accompanied by Penny Bernstein herself. Uh, and this is something that uh, Kaserik uh, just can't just deny his rem remembering at all. Uh, and again, this this happened while Stephen was still, uh, you know, in, 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 in jail for this. So it happened within six or seven days of his of his uh, arrest, maybe even a couple of days of his uh, arrest. Uh, because he hadn't, Stephen uh, Griesbach specifically said that he still hadn't gotten access to a telephone. And we know that uh, Stephen didn't get a phone call in that first case for a whole week. Um, so, and so Stephen, uh, Stephen was arrested that night. Yeah, that's right. He, he was, he was, he was arrested that night. Yep. Um, so, uh, you know, what? Fl fl flipping back to slide uh, eight, um, you know what? The, so let's talk about uh, you know Griesbach. Uh, did Griesbach tell you uh, whether or not he had any concerns about Vogel having contacted him uh, and inquired about whether there was there was material material concerning Gregory Allen in the DA's file? Um, answer: uh, She's asking, uh, did Griesbach convey to us that he was concerned? Question: Yes. Answer: uh, I don't know that he convey, conveyed he was concerned. But he wrote a memo about it, which you know if you're concerned about, well, I guess concerned. If you want to document if you want to document contact, you always write it down. I'm asking if he elaborated on the memo. Answer, oh, uh, and said to you anything that you remember about his concerns. Answer, no, I just remember him saying that he was contacted and that he wrote it down. Well, he had a much different statement in his book, and he had a much different statement in front of that panel. Um, uh, so, uh, I, to, 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 me, he was, uh, you know, I mean, and, uh, and this does happen as time goes on, uh, you know, this is, this is the heat of the 1985 case. Uh, and, uh, I, I don't, I don't recall, I don't recall, uh, the exact, uh, date of when his book came out or the, well, obviously after Avery's conviction, uh, or the date of that panel, but, uh, he certainly was not shy or afraid to say what he felt about Dennis Ogle. Um, and, and his malfeasance and he, the fact that he probably knew, but went ahead with the prosecutor, uh, any, any prosecution anyway. Um, I'll move on to slide nine, uh, if that's okay. Uh, and this is just, uh, um, uh, th there's a, another officer in the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office whose name is Belts, at the time B-E-L-Z. Uh, and uh, Belts indicates, yeah, um, that it was that was his impression on the case. So I won't read, read this whole whole slide. Uh, but Belts tells uh, the uh, pair of, of Amy Lehman and uh, uh, Deb Strauss that you know he handled this one a little bit differently than he handled the the other ones, because if you look down just that bottom left hand portion. It appeared from this, this investigation that the sheriff was really involved in this one, which wasn't the norm. So, uh, you know, if, 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 we, if we can't start to, to smell what's going on here, uh, that, that, there was, that there was real malfeasance, that they really had Stephen, that, 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 that they, that they um, you know, that, 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 that they had that their eyes on him and they were willing to do whatever it took, um, it, it seems to me that that's emerging. So flipping to flipping to slide ten, um, why why don't we why don't we say why don't we use the words of of Amy of Amy and Deb themselves in an email that went up to uh, to Jennifer Nashold? Uh, question. Here's the question. Uh, that's an exchange of email between you and Deb on on the one hand, and the attorneys in Madison on the other hand. 
those attorneys in Madison are Jennifer Nashold, uh, is what, who is the recipient of the, of the um, investigative reports of Deb and Amy, and turned that into the, the, the first couple of drafts of the, uh, of the Pegel report. Um, yes, question. And that takes place, I believe, on the 22nd of October, 2003, well in the investigation. Let me just, uh, question, let me just see for a moment if I might. Is it true on that occasion, you and Deb and lawyers, uh, that it appears the two of you, uh, that the two, th to the two of you, uh, that you agree that there was really no investigation done by the Sheriff's Department. They had a suspect and they were gonna make it work. Uh, and, and that's what's a little troubling to you is the lack of paperwork that's done and so forth. So, so, uh, so, so both Deb uh, and Amy uh, are reporting to uh, the, 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 the people in Madison that there doesn't ha that does not appear to be uh, the case that an investigation was done. As a matter of fact, they use the phraseology in their email to Madison that no investigation is done was was done. And of course, there was a lot of you know, objecting and whatnot after that email. So uh, that the, the um, Kelly or um, Glenn is forced to rephrase the question. I think it was Steve Kelly that, that interviewed um, Lehman. Uh, well, I can ask it in another way. Uh, is there, to your knowledge, uh, is there any communication by you and Deb speaking for each other in which you change what you say in that email on the 22nd of October, right? In other words, uh, they, they, never, they never recant. They never discover after the 22nd of October there was an actually an investigation done. So uh, the, 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 the phrase, no investigation done stands. Of course, we don't, we don't have the exhibits, uh, Travis, I wish we, I wish we did, uh, but they're talking about a specific email and that, that, that phrase exists in an email that I, that I can't, that I can't, uh, that I can't visually quote. Um, so we're getting close to the end of the, of the presentation here. And um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's sort of very, it's sort of very interesting uh, that um, under cross-examination, uh, Vogel's lawyer, uh, whose, uh, uh, whose name is um, uh, Mr. Corvelli, starts to ask questions. Uh, and the questions that he starts to ask are, uh, you know, very, very interesting. Um, and so, you know, just um, start to read, uh, you know, one of them. Uh, question, if you look at the next page, does the witness give an identification? Does the victim give an identification of her attacker? Answer, she described him uh, as about 5'10 and quite chubby, flabby, thin, almost bald, bushy blonde mustache, no glasses, about 30 years old. Um, uh, question, okay, all right, let's go to the beach incident on the page. I think that's Bates uh, 5405. Uh, okay, go back one more page. Okay, uh, is that she applicable to the August 2nd incident in 1983? Yes, it looks like it. And does it identify in the first page uh, how tall Mr. Allen was? 5'10", and how much did he weigh? 200 pounds. Very interesting. Uh, and the next question, which I, which I got cut uh, the, uh, out, of, out of this presentation, um, uh, is, is a very interesting one. It said, do, does that match the description of Stephen Avery? Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we know Stephen, we, we know how tall Stephen is. I think Stephen's five, six, if I'm not mistaken, right? We have Stephen's mugshot and they have right. the numbers behind, um, he's 66 inches tall. Uh, and, uh, how, how much would you imagine he weighs? Um, 150, 165, something like that. He was in good shape. Uh, yeah. Stephen was in good shape in that. You, 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 you can see mm -hmm. he was not flabby. Um, yeah, I've never seen a you know, we don't have a picture of him with his shirt off, but you can kind of tell by the width of his shoulders that he's uh, that that he's in, uh, in in decent shape, not 200 pounds and and flabby, um, and uh, you know you know he had a mustache, uh, but it was not really bushy. If you see the pictures of Greg, Gregory Allen, uh, Gregory Allen was had had a, had a big bushy mustache. The clearly the, to me the intent of that question is that no, um, that description doesn't actually fit Stephen Avery very well at all because it's way too tall and way too heavy. Um, so, uh, you know, what the question that I have is, why is Vogel's lawyer asking that question of Amy Lehman? 
uh, and it just seems to me uh, that the reason that the, the reason for that is that uh, you know that that Vogel's lawyer is sort of setting the stage to to say, well, you know, I, I prosecute the cases that I'm given by the police by the sheriff's department, uh, and this this is their fault because you know they they arrested Gregory Allen because he matched the description. I was told he matched the description. Uh, but it turns out that he doesn't. It's, that, that's not my fault. This is the police making this mistake, not me. Um, so uh, that, that's uh, really, I think the um, yeah. There's there's some yeah. I mean, yeah, it's 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 that 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 was sort of the the the, the point of this is um, you know is what was Vogel's lawyer uh, and I, I'd love to try and get you the deposition, to ha uh, Travis. But we have to cl obviously clear that through uh, Banana Man because of the rules of the of the for, of the um, uh, funding, the GoFundMe. Um, and uh, th th there's there's more than that. Uh, th th there's more there's more than that in there. Most of the questions, uh, many of the questions asked by Vogel's lawyer, sort of um, you know uh, go at the, the, these th these foundational things uh, that really implicate the, uh, the the sheriff's office as you know get, getting the wrong guy and this being their fault. Um, so that that is, um, you know, what makes me wonder, uh, you know, what did what did Vogel tell his lawyer? Was Vogel getting ready to flip on this? Uh, and, uh, you know, was there a real need for a plan, uh, you know, plan B, if you will, uh, because this uh, investigation was going very badly for the, uh, you, know, you, you know, very, very badly for the, um, you know, for Manitowoc County, for Tom Kasurik and for Dennis Vogel. Did I need Plan B? Uh, so I guess the last thing that's worth talking about um, is, you know, slide 13, uh, and that's the redirect uh, in, in, information. Uh, and uh, you know, it just talks about um, the interview of Arland Avery. So Arland Avery is Stephen's uncle, who worked for the. Did he work for mobility for the police or the sheriff's office? Worked for the sheriff's department. Works for the sheriff's department. He's right, the so. one that convinced Stephen to turn himself in when they went to his house that night, along with Bushman and a few other officers. Yep. Um, you and Miss Strauss interviewed Arlen Avery, who told you certain things about what he saw in terms of cement chalk on the shoulder of Stephen Avery on the evening that he was arrested. Do you remember that? Yes. Uh, and Arlen Avery also told you about a conversation he had with District Attorney Vogel concerning his prospective testimony about that, what he had seen, I believe so. Uh, and what's your recollection of what he told you uh, that District Attorney Vogel told him about what he was to say with, concerning the residue of that chalk? Uh, can I look it up in my report? Is it in there? Uh, and of course, their objection, you can't look at the report. Uh, and maybe you can explain to us, Travis, and th throughout all these depositions, um, very often the the witnesses are are being forced to testify from memory without re without um, being able to reference certain material and this is one of those cases this is one of those instances here uh, where she asks to, to be able to look at her report and they they eventually say no you can't and so she uh, eventually has to admit that she has no independent recollection but of course Arlen Avery being you know being working for the sheriff's office even though he is a family member uh, was with Stephen when they were pouring the concrete. Uh, Nineteen witnesses had him there pouring the concrete, uh, and uh, you know somebody, you know somebody in the in the most excellent uh, crime lab performed a test on uh, Stephen's clothes to see whether or not there was cement residue on those clothes, and and the uh, the the crime lab came back and said no. So it makes you wonder. Uh, if you know who who was that person that did that uh, test, and did that cement residue get stuck in her hair, forming it into this Dr. Seuss shape that you could that never come out of it? Um, but that but we but we don't know the answer to that to that question. Uh, and just yet, you know, can you can you get bad information out of the crime lab? Yes, you can. Uh, so uh, there, there you have it. Uh, that that's the end of the the the, the, the presentation. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, my, my personal feeling is that this was a gigantic railroad. Um, I, I don't know what else to point to uh, as to what uh, caused.
caused it other than the, um, you know, the, the, the Sandra Morris incident, Stephen's cousin, uh, you know, where he, uh, in, in a, in a re really bad idea, decided, you know, it was a, uh, he, he thought it would be a good thing if he ran her off the road because he didn't like what she was saying about, uh, she was saying about him. And it turned out that she's married to a Manitowoc County Sheriff. Uh, and her kid was in the car. Uh, really stupid thing to do. Stephen did serve seven years in prison for that. He deserved it. Um, but I totally believe that this was uh, payola for for that. Um, and uh, the, I guess the last thing I'd say about the Penny Bernstein case is that, um, you know, even though it was critically important to, to give Stephen a 32-year sentence for this crime, uh, when when he was exonerated and it was well known, it, Greg, Gregory Allen did it uh, because of the DNA. They didn't think it was so critical that somebody served the uh, you know the sixty the, the uh, sorry the uh, thirty the thirty two years for this crime. And uh, Penny's Penny's uh, the, the 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 set the, the sort of the punishment for for the, what what happened to Penny really has not happened at all. As a matter of fact, I think. My, my recollection is that Gregory Allen recently came up for parole. I mean, he wasn't granted it, but my recollection is that he came up for parole. They, uh, maybe, maybe somebody can comment on that. Um, but yeah, uh, so they didn't, they didn't give it to him. Uh, but uh, Pe Pe Penny's crime is unavenged, even though we know yep. who did it, because it's not worth prosecuting her. Nobody's been charged for it. Yep. Statue of so, limitations barred them from going after Allen, I believe. In, in 85, or sorry, in uh, 2003, yep. when Stephen got out. Yep. Yeah. Well, I guess, uh, Travis, I'm out of breath. <laughs> it's your turn to talk. <laughs> well, I've, I've got a couple of comments. So on Vogel, I uh, have to read through the whole transcript or, you know, maybe a couple of them, but I think I have a reason why Vogel comes from a different angle that's kind of uh, may uh, throw you off. So was Vogel a named defendant? Yes. Um, so him and Kishurik and Vogel's were the last two depositions that were supposed to take place, but they never happened. Okay. And they, uh, they named Vogel as a individual defendant. Correct. Okay. Yes. Uh, I got to dig up my copy of the federal complaint. So for a prosecutor, they have absolute immunity on prosecution. Mm -hmm. So um, the only thing they can be sued for is if they get too involved in the investigation and they're part of a conspiracy of a railroad, for example. So those are the reasons why those questions are that way. Vogel's attorney is just showing that Vogel relied on the police. He wasn't active in any investigation. He wasn't, con or what he's trying to show is that Vogel wasn't running the investigation, wasn't an active participant in the investigation, simply took the information, like you said, Jeff, that was being provided to him by police and used that as an advocate in a court of law and uh, would have absolute immunity. Um, and so unless they came up with something in these depositions, um, in 1983 actions like this, what happens, um, first there's a round of motions to dismiss. And then if you get past that, um, we see it um, in the Netflix uh, Andy Colburn case. There was a round of motions to dismiss. Um, the plaintiff saw Andy Colburn's lawyers, uh, one of which is Griesbach, right? Yeah. Uh, whose brother is the federal judge, right? Yeah. Um, so you go through this round of what you call motion to dismiss and Colburn's lawyer said, yeah, you're right on this. And so they amended the complaint, even though Netflix lost on amending that complaint, 
the amendment was Colburn was trying to take the position he wasn't a public official, was which there's a much higher standard you have to show against a public official to win on defamation, mm -hmm. which is um, malice versus if I defame one of you, I'm not a public uh, official, uh, you could do it by negligence. So they lost the battle, but they won a huge victory in that. So there's this first round of motions to dismiss. Then if you survive that, then you go to discovery and you do these depositions. And then in 1983 actions, uh, the, city or the county files a motion for what they call summary judgment because in order to get liability against the county you have to show that either they had policies which were unconstitutional or they were deliberately indifferent to unconstitutional activities or conduct they turned a blind eye towards it so you that's what they have to show um, otherwise they they get out frequently happens with police mixed conduct cases the city and the county and the state still remain liable um, but um depending on the circumstances, if you show that the conduct occurred while they were in the course and scope of their business or their activities as a public official, like a police officer, the city or the county is still going to have to foot the bill. So that's what happened in the Ryan Ferguson case after um, Selner got Ryan Ferguson exonerated. He then had a bench trial um, the city had already been dismissed, uh, but they got a nine or 10, $11 million verdict the judge gave uh, them. Then the city had a two or $3 million policy. And so Zellner sell settled with the city and said, we'll just take your policy proceeds Three million, let's say, and you assign us the right to sue your insurance <coughs> company. So th this is always the big haggle. You know, how much is insurance going to cover? Is there? Uh, you just try and get that big chunk of money up front, and then go after the insurance companies. But th there's all this litigation behind the scenes that you don't even see. But um, there was going to, so what Vogel's lawyers trying to do is show that they, there's no genuine issue of fact, uh, material issue of fact, so that nobody in a deposition says, uh, well, no, Vogel told us to go out and do this, or Vogel told us to go out and do that, or no, Vogel was clearly aware what this chalk was or um and if there's no genuine issue of material fact then vogel was going to be let out on uh summary judgment um so that's that's kind of why those questions come at these uh, obscure angles different from everybody historic and the individuals and the uh, people for the sheriff's office, they're, um, they're more aligned. But, you know, and this was always a really, really good case for Stephen. Uh, I thought because those two investigators that Jeff started with from the top, they did a better job than they thought they did and <laughs> got all got all of these people when they interviewed them with the 302 statements whatever they call them in wisconsin and they you know uh 
they remembered everything and provided all of the <laughs> info. And um, it was Walt Kelly who said, yeah, we just got all of this great stuff. We couldn't believe it. And then w- what was even more remarkable is that in deposition, uh, they would try and go against that in the most obscure ways imaginable. Well, you got to remember um, the state's uh, recollection of what happened after Stephen was released when they did their investigation is that the victim identified the wrong person. That's right. And that's, that's what Peg says in Peg's report. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody runs for cover, right? And um, right. so, uh, but that's pretty pretty horrific to do victim blaming but uh grease box segment i guess he's speaking it may be some sort of wrongful conviction yeah, it was, yeah uh, seminar. it was a seminar in florida okay um i'd heard uh, like a five second clip of that i've never seen that i have the whole, whole thing. thing i have the whole thing and, uh, send it to you if you want yeah I'll do that um 20 minutes long i think but um, no, it's you know absolutely horrific. Uh, definitely um, things going on. You know about the only thing I think I disagree with you on, Jeff, is that this is enough for somebody to go out and murder a. Uh, an unsuspecting female just happens along an opportunity to create, you know, because they had a much, much better case to frame him on with Marie's allegations of sexual assault m- months before, um, while the litigation was going, but, you know, two, three months before. And if you're going to go, as far as to, you know, to murder somebody in order to frame somebody to get out of a civil case, um, I think you'd be willing to do whatever you need, you know, you think you'd be willing to plant DNA and do what you needed to do uh, with regard to um, Marie. But um, there's no question it was, you know, it's never going to get 36 million. Um, it's going to come in between somewhere between two and five. He would have got I don't more know. 400,000, that's for sure. We, oh, yeah. No, <laughs> no doubt. But I think mo- most of that would have been insured. Um, people talk about, well, you know, punitive damages. And with this kind of liability, nobody was going to let their client go to trial. Um, I thought the insurance companies he came back. I thought what? You thought what about the insurance? Oh, he's frozen. Insurance company. I know. I know both of them tried to get their home insurance company to pay for the bill, and they denied that. And then I'm assuming after they settled, they probably did. No. So what? What happened is. Uh, the, the county's insurers were paying uh, to defend the county, Historic, Vogel, um, whoever else. Um, they were all paying under the county's policy for that. And then the county's insurance company said, well, part of this may be personal conduct. So um, we think uh, Kasurik's homeowners carrier should come in too and split the cost of defense because uh, defense costs are equal. So if there's three insurance companies and I have a million dollar policy and Jeff has a $10,000 policy and Millbilly has a $100,000 policy defense costs are split three ways. So if there's a million dollar in fees, each company has got to write a check to the lawyers for 333,000. A third, yep. So, but versus my company having to write a million in fees versus 
333000 it's a big incentive for them to seek free possible insurance they can. Then when it comes to paying a judgment at pro rata, so if there was an agreement to settle for 400000 then uh, you'd take the total, a million plus 100000 plus a 10. I should have figured rounder numbers that was dumb so we're at a million million one hundred thousand ten uh one hundred and ten thousand you'd uh take that total um and then that would be the denominator and you'd divide it in the numerator ten thousand a hundred thousand and a million to figure out what percentage each uh, company would contribute um, but a lot of that stuff is insurance gamesmanship and politics um, that happen in a, a lot of a lot of cases but um, I don't know um, what their limits of liability were in Manitowoc people have brought up well you know the individuals were being sued for punitive damages which is true they're all individuals are always sued for punitive damages in 1983 actions because you cannot get punitive damages against a county or a city under Supreme Court case law under about 1983. Um, and um, so the, but as a practical matter, when they, when the insurance company sees exposure on the sheriff or sees exposure on um, individual police officers, those cases get settled and they usually get settled pretty quick. And, and when the settlement kicks in is after the motions for summary judgment are filed, which uh, another case y'all are loosely familiar with, Eagle Nation. Um, mm -hmm. So they, the widow had an excellent lawyer. And he proved that all up, um, but it went on motion for summary judgment and the county or it was the city um, and the police got out under qualified immunity. Um, and Griesbach was the one that ruled on that and said qualified immunity applies. But after the Floyd case in Minneapolis, we learned just how unfair qualified immunity can be and has been for a long, 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 long time. And then, uh, so I don't know how big their uh, policy was, but the, um, how long did Stephen actually do on that sexual assault case? How many years? 11. If you, okay. take, if you take away the 7 for Sandra Morris, right, you had 18 years in prison minus 7 for Sandra Morris leaves 11. Right, so he went in for 7, came out, and then he did 11 more? He never came out. It, it, was, it was the same. They, they, try, they tried him for Sandra Morris at the same time they tried him for Penny Burns. Yeah, the cases were run concurrent. So 18 years he spent in prison. Six of it actually was for the Sandra Morris case. That's what Kratz okay. tries to emphasize when he says, yes, yes, he spent 18 years in prison, but six of it was justified. But well, it, who's to say if he was, if he had just not, oh, not a puppy, if he yeah, hadn't yeah. been a suspect <laughs> in uh, the Bernstein case and he just went to court for the Sandra Morris thing, you think he uh, would have got that much his time? Problem, his problem no, on, San, on Sandra Morris was the gun charge. Yeah, that's the thing, though. When Since the cases were tried concurrent, when they released him in 2003, they dropped the, all the charges. They forgot to resubmit the felon charge for the gun. They fucked up. Yeah. Kratz had to add it back in to his record. That's why they get the search warrants for his yeah, DNA I, on the 7th. People saying that, but it, it's not that way on paper. The, I don't know. The, he brags the, about it in his book. The, yeah. the, the Felony judgment. I don't know what he's talking about. Well, the well, felony judgment. <laughs> he's got that gun charge never went away. He had a conviction for that. Well, it, 
the, that's the I thing, mean, though. the judge. Uh, they the, filed for the search warrants for their DNA and palm prints and everything on the 7th. They delay serving those so they can then get that gun charge. Because they, when they show up to get him on the 9th, yeah. it's not, it's, oh, we're arresting you. A, Richard and I used to talk about that all the time. And I'd say, what is it? Is it that it wasn't in NCIC? And so it didn't pop up that he was a convicted felon. Um, I think whoever. What was, what was it that they had to reinstate? Because you can't reinstate a judgment. Judgment's there or not. Well, you go look at his docket. This, the Penny Bernstein well, well, case is still open on his record. Yeah, I'm not was, talking was, about that. I'm talking about was the, his record the gun conviction. When, when he got exonerated? I yeah. mean, did they, wipe, did they accidentally wipe his they, whole record? That's what I'm saying. No, they, they, they didn't. Had to they, didn't they, they didn't do that. It's there. You can, you can, anybody who knows how to look up docket stuff, those convictions are, but, are there plain as day for then why at did, least the gun charge. Why didn't they, they do that on day one? Why, why was he able to get a hunting license? I don't license? know what it was that Kratz did. All I'm telling <laughs> you is the judgment's there. There was no problem with the judgment. Um, because I'll guarantee you if the judgment got wiped accidentally and then they tried to put it back in, the only way you can do that is with the clerk's office. It, it just it never happened. So I don't know what Kratz did. I'd have to see what he says, and I'm not going to buy his book, and I don't want anybody <laughs> to go out and buy his book to let me know. Um, but I'd have to know what he said in there. But he, uh, that was brought up, and Richard said, well, no, you know, Kratz had to go do something. And it's like, okay, uh, there are crime reporting systems in Wisconsin. Maybe it accidentally got wiped out of the crime reporting system. That doesn't take away a judgment you're still a felon yeah but yeah. Oh, i'm a, we're in good company if we're agreeing with richard but i'd like to know <laughs> what that is because richard could never put a put his finger on it but so a chunk of the civil suit on penny bernstein's case they would have been able to argue at um trial so let's just assume the, the murder stuff just never happened okay so they're going to argue okay yeah he was in you know because i think they came up with uh 18 years two million a year 36 right yep okay and so they were they were going to get up and argue he was and seeking say, what? 36 million doesn't mean he was going to get it Right, right, but no, I, that, but the number where the number came from, yeah. thirty-six million. Yeah, you can ask for anything you want, but you know what? What you're going to get is up to the jury, and they can even award more than you want, um, mm. or or more what you than what you put. Um, and so the um, defense gets to argue on damages also, and they would have said, well, he was going to be in there for whatever seven years anyway, so. That's uh, that's fourteen million. You got to knock off right there, and then, then you know, you say whatever bad stuff you got into evidence about why mm -hmm. he doesn't deserve all of that money, or why for him doing prison time, it's not as valuable as somebody else doing. You know, whatever you argue, you know, and um, uh, it would have been ultimately ultimately up to the jury, but. I don't know where that federal court is. Were they in Milwaukee or? Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, so I don't know how federal juries are there. They draw the jurors don't just come from Milwaukee and federal court. Mm -hmm. They come from all counties in that district. Um, and it's six person juries, not 12 in a, in a federal civil case, mm -hmm. but it's usually not lost on them that, Ultimately, it's the taxpayers who this falls on. So there, there's what I'm saying is federal juries will award substantial awards, but they're not like sometimes what you see in state court, although that federal judge for um, 
Ryan Ferguson, whatever it was, 10 or $11 million for a much, much shorter period of time. But um, he may have been a, a much, much more um, sympathetic plaintiff. The, it's, you know, it's not fair, it's not justice, but, uh, you know, it's, if, if a prostitute's the victim of police misconduct, maybe sexual assault by a police officer, mm-hmm. happens to be somebody of color, it's just a fact that that's going to be worth uh, less money than, um, you know, somebody like Penny Bernstein, who had been a victim of police misconduct, you know, it's going to be worth substantially more. And there's, you know, a lot of reasons for that. But um, no, I think they were going to get, he, he was going to, he would have gotten something if he survived motions for summary judgment. He was going to get something fairly substantial. I think Zellner thought three to four. My number was a little bit higher. I, I thought he might end up five or six. That hadn't happened. So, and that didn't happen. We you know that he got arrested um, on a new gun charge and ultimately. And, and that was to stop the depositions. Who knows? Well, you well, stop stop Ver- versus Versus getting a uh, murderer rapist off the street? I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm telling you. What happened to innocent to proven guilty? Well, that, that doesn't go away. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everything. You're innocent until up proven until, guilty. Up but until, there's they, this up until that, they arrested him, they have a car on a family property. It's not his property. And they, a suspected key planted in his bedroom. They have no clue that blood was coming back as his yet in the rev. Nothing at all. They've got a gun in his house. I know, and that's why they arrested him to stop the depositions. That's not, it wasn't well, even his, it was Rolly Johnson's. They, because the they arrested went, him. On a gun charge. Um, and then they well, filed I, I, the, the, the homicide charges after. I think they arrested him because they had tunnel vision and all of, all of that. Um, you know, I suppose it could be, oh, you know, we're worried about this um, civil case. And uh, they could have just stopped, stopped there, right? I mean, well, of course somebody went ahead and didn't get the memo about not killing Teresa. Right. So. The- well, I mean, there's another, there's another factor too there, Travis, I think that we can't ignore. Uh, and, and that, and that is, you know, it, you know it, it, if you look at the politics of the situation, right. Uh, when he got out, there was um, the, this, the set, the, the guy who's the judge now, what the heck is his name? Who, who's probably going to have to recuse himself? Um, oh, Gundrum. Well, the Avery Bill. Gundrum, Gundrum. right? Start, starts the Avery Bill, uh, and you know, it's, you, a lot of times in politics, when one side of the aisle starts up one thing, the other side of the aisle can be one do one of two things. The other side of the aisle can sort of oppose it and say you're nuts, or the other side of the aisle can sort of jump on board and uh, sort of turn this uh, this this uh, uh, this molehill into a mountain. <laughs> and that's what was happening in Wisconsin at the time, right? Is is that uh, you know all eyes and ears were were, were on this. Uh, there was there was investigations, uh, and even though the peg whitewash had happened, uh, this was still moving forward, and there was going to be uh, you know investigations and and hearings and and and, and, all, and all that sort of stuff where people were going to you know sort of make hay against their uh, th- their enemies. And in my mind, the the power structure. Uh, was it was at stake as well? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, Kisurik and his cronies. Um, you know, that was you know sort of the 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 you know it was it was a it was and a bad day mention, for, for Boss Hog. Let's other thing, uh, <laughs> Colborn was about to start running for sheriff, and if this all would have came out, it would have ruined him completely. No, so that I, I think the very very 
well, true. We know he ended up running, running and he lost uh, to Herman. Yeah. Oh, uh, 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 yeah. Uh, I, I never thought that. I don't think the cops killed her, Travis. I know. I, no. I don't. I don't think that. I never. I, I never they thought took that. Advantage of a situation. That's what I think. Yeah. Well, so, but why did the deposition stop? Because Stephen was so, arrested. Because Stephen got arrested. <laughs> right, but that's not why they stopped. The, the case can still go forward. Yeah, but he had to be present because. Yeah. His two lawyers agreed with the other lawyers and said, uh, let's cease the depositions and um, until we get this sorted out. There was a mutual agreement to stop discovery. Yeah, I, I think that was the biggest mistake he made. You, you have to do that if you're so... Um, which one's the defense attorney that's with Dean's office, Walter? Steve, uh, Glenn, Glenn. Stephen Glenn. Glenn. Stephen Glenn. That's the first thing you do is say, are, are you all agreeable to suspend discovery or do I need to go to the judge to get an order? Because Stephen's depot hadn't been taken yet, which means they could have noticed Stephen's deposition and everything was fair game and they weren't going to open Stephen up uh, to being asked about the circumstances of um, that murder or that gun or so and then you know there was people people saying until um, you know they got the phone calls of Stephen through FOIA they're saying oh he was pressured and whatnot um, I heard all of the um, conversations between Stephen Glenn and Stephen, and he wasn't pressuring Stephen. He no, was, he advised him that they should stop the lawsuit, put it on hold, and then he advised him that they should take the settlement, and then he can use that money for his defense, and he's got a lawyer that works with him that will take his case. Right, which I think 99% of the lawyers, um, you know, especially Walt Kelly, uh, pretty savvy guy and a top lawyer there, you know, being on board with that, I think 90% of the lawyer, 99% in that same position are going to do the same thing because they know if they want the case to go forward, the federal judge is probably going to let it proceed forward, but the case is worth zero mm -hmm. while the, while the murder charge is pending the case, uh, the civil case, the discovery could, could have been devastating um, to Steven with his deposition and whatnot, which they could use in the state case potentially. Um, you know, it just, well, it's just why, another why, one of the, the tragedies that um <laughs> why on the day that they find the car on his property this his parents sell his yard property is the assistant attorney general calling the manitowoc sheriff's department insisting that he needs to talk to the district attorney asap you know i i i don't know but i can tell you that <laughs> Zellner, Zellner has affirmatively stated that she doesn't think law enforcement is the killer. Yeah, um, she can see anything she wants in a tweet until she gets into court and law. Don't no, she's in court. I'm talking about her. I'm talking about her briefs. Oh yeah, What's her briefs. Before, okay. Before the appellate court, she said law enforcement is not um, involved in the killer. The real killer. You know, it started out as A and B. Now it's, you know, they're by name. Um, Redont was a, a hey, possible hey. Um, at one point in the motion for scientific testing. And then after she met with him and his lawyer, that dropped out. But, you know, the, you all know who the three are. And um, yes. she pounds on that in the briefs. And then, unfortunately, there's other than... Um, the groin swabs. 
she's um, affirmatively alleged and averred that there was no, the key. No, sorry, mis the key. misconduct on digging those swabs out of the trash. And then um, whether Colhane knew or not, you know, that's kind of an open question in our briefs, but you know, the, um, there's just nothing, unfortunately, that she was able to develop through either um, the billboard on rewards, um, all of the things uh, like that. You, you hope you catch a break or you hope that somebody finds a conscience or um, and I've seen that happen. There's a real famous case in Houston where um, an officer shot and uh, killed somebody in a moving vehicle, a young man who had stolen a car and uh, driven through a, a dealership, um, big giant window and uh, Turned out he didn't have a gun and he planted a gun. And then years and years later, a reporter who was part of that scheme uh, got a conscience and went and told a U.S. attorney about it. And they said, wow, that's weird. And they went and ran that gun. And that gun was supposed to be in the evidence locker of the Houston Police Department and you know how, how can how could this kid have gotten a gun out of the evidence locker anyway so heads rolled on that and a lot of money was paid um, so any of that is certainly possible there was a case two three years ago in Wisconsin where um, they searched a backpack and a deputy did and said, Hey, look, I found this guy's wallet and an ID, the victim's wallet and ID. Um, that prosecutor said, you know, there's just something fishy here. Anyway, long story short on that, they um, figured out the guy planted it. He was a fairly new officer, less than a year, trying to, look good and do stupid things. He was prosecuted and convicted of some sort of felony. I don't know what he got, but, um, you know, but other prosecutors, other departments would, you know, take a blind eye to that or never question it. Um, and so a lot of what um, Griesbach saw was con concerning to him. And I, I think would be to, um, most lawyers, but I, I know prosecutors that that wouldn't be, they'd, they'd figure out a way and they, they would rationalize it however they rationalize things to, to make it all right. But, um, you know, it's, um, there's certainly very, very strange goings on in this case, more than 80 things, clearly. And, um, <laughs> but unfortunately, none of those things have risen to the point that uh, Zellner could put in front of a put in front of a court. You know. Oh, well, but you're not. You're certainly not saying, though, Travis, that um, if she gets her new trial, which we all hope that she does, that she's not going to be arguing that that uh, Colbert and Link planted the key. She's not going to be arguing that item FL well, was probably well, planted. Of course she is to the oh, extent. Yeah, the yeah. thing about this, okay. To the extent uh, she can, but Strang and yeah. Dean argued that they planted the key. During Brendan Dassey's interview, <clears throat> while Weigert and Fassbender are interviewing Brendan Dassey, multiple people from the Calumet County Sheriff's Department, including Sheriff Poggle, Go to where they're storing all the evidence for their case. And then Wendy Baldwin goes to the Avery property. Don't know what she's going there with, but that's prior to Brendan Dassey's interview ending and them arriving on the property to search. 
Yeah, if it wasn't wasn't brought up at trial, it's you know no you no use to Brendan. No, it's not used to Brendan, but it surely helps Stephen. Well, not at this stage. No, unless, once she gets he gets a new trial, he gets a new trial that could be brought oh, up. But for sure, you got to understand. Me. You know, it's um, uh, it's like they were reviewing the evidence that they had in their possession. Because it's right after. Yeah, the, but it, you've got you've got to see how these retrials are years and years later. Even if you know that's a big question if they even retried them or not. What um, a lot of people, you know. Okay, have the well, hope let's say or, let's say Stephen Avery gets a new trial and he's found not guilty. What happens with Brendan? Do you think? It, it depends what evidence they're able to um, develop in that. I, I think that would um, give him a chance to file a, a state writ uh, motion for post-conviction relief because he hasn't done one yet. And so he, he can file that at any time. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly is going to put uh, much, much more pressure on um, the governor at the time uh, to consider something in the way of clemency or a pardon. Um, but what I'm what I'm telling you is, frequently, if they think that they're now in a position where they have a bad case, They'll just decide not to retry it. We'll never know. That's what happened with the West Memphis Three K. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the Colburn's lawsuit on the twenty second of this month, they're having a conference call with everybody, and each side is going to be given ten minutes to state their side of the case, and then they're going to decide what to do moving forward. So um, there was the last time I looked at it, there was one issue remaining, and that was on the. Um, producers mm -hmm. and um, it looked like they did not get them served properly and so Judge Coffey um, again we talked about earlier with regard to Netflix they um, lost the motion for summary judgment but um, Actually, they got a huge win because they forced um, public figure. Oh, he went mute. They forced him to amend his pleadings um, to um, acknowledge that he's a public figure and a public official. But so the only issue that was kind of hanging out there at the time was um, the motion to dismiss by Laura and. Um, Moira. Moira. Um, and their production company. And um, the pandemic can't, they never had that evidentiary hearing that I'm aware of. And they needed to get that figured out. And then what was going to happen from there is um, they were going to start proceeding with discovery and depositions and so on and so forth. And so, you know, That's going to happen whether... Um, well, how do you prepare for a 10-minute presentation to state your case? Because well, it's been assigned to a new judge, too. Um, I wasn't aware of that either. I haven't pulled that pacer on it in months uh, yeah. because all the courts... You're not around, watching Billy's videos, Travis. That's awful. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to go look it up and find, I'm going to go look it up and find it. It was assigned to a new judge uh, and, in September 18th, I believe. And the document Who, that I seen, uh, I can't remember his name. Hold on. All right, so that's uh, that's the new appointee. So that's going to be um, so ten minutes. It just depends on what um, the hearing is. If the hearing is to get the party's positions on whether discovery judge, should judge Judge Ludwig. Brett H. Ludwig. It says the case was reassigned to Judge Brett H. Ludwig on September 18th, 2020. A status conference will be held via conference. 
call uh, on okay, October 22nd, appear okay. by telephone. Yep. Uh, counsel should be ready to provide court with a short 10 minute per side summary of the case, including their plans for moving forward with the case. Okay, so uh, that's more than enough time. You get to pre pre you get to prepare and present your written plan ahead of time, and then you just say, "Judge, as you can see, uh, the plaintiffs are going to say, Judge, uh, we have the technology now. We should proceed forward with depositions by Zoom, which is being done, um, and this case needs to move forward." Now, if I call that phone number, can I can I watch it? <laughs> Pull it back up. I, I want to kind of keep you out of keep you out of jail. Pull it back up. <laughs> hey, while he's pulling that back up, Travis, a, a, a question um, that you may have answered before, but I don't remember the answer, uh, and that is, if discovery happens uh, in this case, or it's opened up for discovery, is there a way for uh, you know Kathleen Zellner to insert herself and say, you know, you know, if you, Corbin, if you want to prove you're not a liar, let's let's see your cell phone records. This is part not, of discovery. Not let's see the tower things. Not officially, but. Um behind the scenes that um, that frequently happens. Uh, that'd be a great day. She would be, you know, in touch with, um, but- um, There you go. There's not gonna be any demonstration and a deposition. Now, if I call this conference line at this number right here and enter this access code before the scheduled hearing, will I be able to listen to it? Or I'll be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Those are not mutually, mutually exclusive. <laughs> well, okay, so this says that would make you a participant. And um, to be a participant, you would either have to be one of the parties or you would have to be admitted to federal court. So I would be very leery of that however right. that. however yes i will <laughs> i'll i'll contact the court um and find out if if the public can listen in on the conference just listen cool. in and i'll get you a number um that's what they're doing now they're putting uh heck they're not even uh one court I'm in, they they stream all of their court hearings live. Yeah, well, I got the audio from the, the when they decided that an evidentiary hearing would be necessary moving forward, and then now this happened. Hmm. Yeah, so everything was That'd put be great. I listened to by um, court order. All the federal court shut down. Henry, mm -hmm. all the federal courts shut down and, uh, you know, they were put on hold. The state courts here have gone um, to platforms like similar to StreamYard um, and they're shown on YouTube and then they delete them right after. So you can, because you constitutional right to a public hearing mm -hmm. can't make it private um, yeah the news is able to get all the video from the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, stuff so all, all 35 seconds of that so yeah if people can dial in out of, as observers that'd be cool I think a lot of people would want to do that um I think uh, T T one. I see him out there. He dial in as the president of Guns for the Blind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I want to thank both of you for this, uh, especially Jeff for the presentation. Travis, your insights always welcome. Always awesome. And yeah, that presentation was excellent. Yeah, thank you for doing that, and uh, I think you really showed. You know, there's a, a deep, dark background to uh, all of that, what, what it ultimately means.
maybe someday we'll know, or we may never know, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we'll have to left with our strong suspicions. Until next time, y'all have a good night. Thank you, Bill Billy. And we're